Yeah. So, my name is uh, Kendrick Trotter. I am a major accounts executive uh, for Radware in the PAC Northwest region specifically. Um, I'm also the founder of Us and Technology. I had a really unique journey of how I transitioned away from being a college athlete to getting in the tech world. Um, it all happened literally through meeting someone um, while I was Ubering, who was a VP of sales, got me connected to the space. And that's where I developed my passion for mentoring and helping other individuals um, transition into the tech industry, specifically uh, minorities. So uh, that's why I created the company called Us and Technology, which the mission statement is to diversify the tech industry with more minorities. Um, in my opinion, a minority is someone of an underrepresented ethnicity, uh, a woman, someone from the LGBTQ community, first generation college graduate. Um, you know, it's a really, really broad idea of like what a minority is, but my goal is to really help anyone at all that may be disadvantaged. So um, I've been mentoring to start off with one person, went to two people, went to 10, 15, now it's like up to 20 people. And I'm very, very, very fortunate to be able to um, call myself one of a Niles uh, mentor. So I appreciate you for having me today. Yeah. All right, Amy. Which one? Quick? Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> All right. Well, first off, Kendrick, like that was awesome. Um, I'm really, I'm really stoked to learn more about that as well. Um, but uh, I'm Amy Quick. I'm a territory account manager with Fortinet. Um, I cover the Mississippi and Alabama territories um, here, representing for cybersecurity. Um, and just really glad to be here. Um, I've been at it for a while, about 16, this is my 16th year in sales. Um, and I've kind of covered the full gambit of everything from SDR inside sales all the way up to enterprise and strategic level sales. So um, if I can give back in some way and, and help someone out and prove their skills a little bit, I'm happy to do so. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Dana, I'm super happy to have you on here. We've been talking for a long Finally. time, fellow Canadian. Yeah. And you're yeah. actually back in Canada last time you were I am, actually. So, yeah, uh, yes, tell us about who you are. You've got a super fun story. Yeah, so I was actually, I was in Mexico earlier this year. I literally landed March 8th in Mexico and then coronavirus blew up the next day. So I ended up staying in kind of a little, a little town close to Cancun for about five months and made my way back to Canada about a month and a half ago. Um, so I was actually there for business and I do two things primarily that really play off of each other. So I have a digital strategy firm here in Toronto that I started about three years ago and we are completely focused on the home buyer and finance industry. So we actually started working with mortgage brokers, something I never thought I would do in my life because I thought it was super boring. But it turns out that because they're so old school, there's so much room to help them either A, even just get a website all the way to doing CRM implementations um, and kind of the full digital strategy spectrum. So been doing that for about three years here in Toronto. Before that, um, I was one of the first biz dev reps hired at a startup here called Nudge in the employee engagement and performance sphere. Um, and then about two and a half years ago, I started learning Spanish as a hobby and became super interested in Latin America because I was doing language exchanges with people that worked for Bloomberg in Peru. You know, we're starting FinTechs in Mexico. Um, and so decided to really go all in at it. And then last year I moved to Mexico for a couple months to kind of just see what was going on there. And when I was there, um, I'd met a guy that wanted to expand his cafe chain into North America and he spoke English, but he didn't really understand how to speak business English. So selling in English, marketing, you know, all of the unsaid things that we kind of take for granted because it's our, I mean, I'm assuming it's all of our first language. Um, so that started my second venture, which is called Dozzy Inc. And I've iterated on that a couple of times, just obviously as you do. So now it primarily does two things. I'll help Latin American companies expand into the North American market by working one-on-one -on -one with their CEO and training them on how to actually do business here. So it's like a combination of cultural and language training. And then the other side that I work on is for people from Latin America that are living and working here in North America and are working in companies like Holt Renfrew or Google or something like that. They're also facing these cultural barriers on a day-to-day -day basis. So I run um, training programs and I'm launching a community actually at the beginning of November to help support them just with understanding why we are the way we are because it's very different. Wow, man, my life seems so not exciting compared to everybody on this call. Uh, <laughs> Amy awesome. with the cool microphone. That's what we'll call you. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Um, so the question on the table is, who am I? And right, that's what we're talking about. So I'm a yeah, yeah, sure. 
I'm Amy Rehubchek. I am actively um, building out the channel director role over at Sales Hacker for their new community. Um, and they let me write every now and then, which has been a lot of fun. But I've got, you know, 10 plus years as an enterprise account executive in the information services space, which I love. Selling information just like changes you as a person, especially when you get people to pay a lot of money for it. But anyway, um, and then I have since transitioned to sales enablement, built out two departments now and looking for forward to, uh, you know, time number three. Awesome. And where, where are you based? I've, I'm in New York City primarily, but I'm currently at the Jersey Shore, which wow. is amazing. And, you know, you can smell the ocean when you get a good breeze every morning. So it helps to keep me in perspective or keep my smallness uh, in perspective compared to the big picture. Oh, and you know what? I would also like to say one quick thing. I am delighted to say that I have absolutely zero agenda today. And this is a total fluke a little bit. It's like the answer is always no, unless you ask. And I, you know, very impressed with this whole uh, operation and I'm, I'm just ecstatic to play. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we, we, we have seemed to have been lucky since we started this in like February, just honestly out of like, Hey, one of us was looking for some feedback on our like sales deck and it's just like snowballed into this. We always get amazing people who want to like give back, which is amazing. So uh, I'll, I'll do a really quick thing and then hand it over to Niles. My, my like pitch is super boring. I'm Francois. Um, I sell software um, and I meet, I meet all these crazy smart people um, on LinkedIn. And then we do this on Friday. Um, I'm in Western Canada, originally from Eastern Canada. Would love to speak Spanish to Dana's level. Speak pretty good French. Um, but uh, Niles, if that's how you pronounce it. I'm thrilled. Yes. You got it right. Honestly, um, I was wondering how to pronounce your name. So it's Frank. You can call me Frank. Said. Frank works. Frank? Francois okay. is how a, a French person would say Frank. it. Um, Francois is kind of how it usually comes out, which is totally. Yeah. Different. The first episode ever, though, you like you pronounced this name like super French. Like it was so funny. You, <laughs> you got to do it. <laughs> well, Come on, you got to do it. Francois is how you would say it. Yeah, but he was like. <laughs> the whole name like first and last name oh, we were like Ooh. oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. a little too fancy yeah yeah so <laughs> so niles you you shared with me like you know here's some things you're looking at but maybe give us some background like who you are what you what you want to do um and and then we can figure out how we can kind of help you out today yeah definitely well thank you uh first and foremost for having me i'm super excited and I'm really excited to hear any feedback that you guys can give me. Uh, my name's Anil DeVoe. I didn't really know that I was gonna be part of this industry until a few months ago. So I am an SDR hired through Memory Blue and my client through them is Sumo Logic. So I started with them in August and first month was just pretty much training. Uh, a lot of training, just learned the product and things like that. And then last month was really my first month hitting the ground running, reaching out to prospects, kind of doing my outreach. So in that last month, a lot of like questions, a lot of things arose uh, that I didn't really know were going to come up. So first thing that right now I feel like I need the most help with is qualifying my prospects enough to get them to that next meeting. Um, right now, I feel like I can get them interested enough to get them to my AE and get them kind of interested to hear what Sumo Logic is and how like we could possibly be of use to them. But I also, I've been reaching out to a lot of different people like within Memory Blue, uh, outside of my job completely and uh, within Sumo Logic to kind of see uh, what an, a good SDR kind of looks like. And I keep getting the feedback of you need to do more qualifying questions, like qualify these people, make sure that they have uh, a project or a certain pain point that they have before you move them into uh, the next meeting. And then on the other hand, I've been getting a lot of feedback, like, no, your job is just to get these people interested. So right now I'm trying to find that happy medium. Like what is that happy medium to get them qualified enough, but not overqualify them where I kind of lose uh, my opportunity. Yes, Amy. I have a question. So it's very difficult to get to a certain place when two people that are giving you feedback are telling you to go to different places. 
So if we, if we could, uh, it's just like a gear, nobody, I, I mean, that's, there's zero chance of that happening. So why don't we dig into that one for a quick second? Um, by the way, kudos to uh, Sumo Logic, by the way, and welcome to the profession. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, what are these two, what, why are there two different proxies for quality lead? What are they? Which person, uh, like, I don't want to say who has more authority or who's right versus who's wrong, but at, you have two choices. You can either highlight the different, like the spread between the two things that you're being told to do, and then ask both people to, you know, confirm, or mm -hmm. you can just opt for whoever's your boss, right? Is a good one, perhaps, um, unless the person that they report to is the other individual who's giving you a different um, proxy for quality. By the way, what you're describing is very, very, very common. It's not something that just happens at Sumo Logic. And it's kind of funny for me because it's very simple to uh, like reduce all of the issues that come with poorly scoped processes or roles or whatever. But we can leave that for a different day. So so I can, I can speak to that a little bit just to help analyze out. So Memory Blue is a company that specializes in outsourcing inside sales consultants to companies that lack sufficient inside sales teams, right? So they have a phenomenal program, which is just nonstop training, right? Specifically for people who are trying to break into entry-level tech sales positions. Um, and so on your first day on the job, you're sourced to a client, right? Um, so by being sourced to a client, you then have a quota that you have in regards to metrics that you're trying to attain and book meetings for them. So as a Memory Blue team member, what announces is in a unique position where she has her Memory Blue manager, right? Um, she has her Sumo Logic manager. And under the Sumo Logic manager, she also has her account executives that she's booking the meetings for. And so I think the bigger discussion that Anals is trying to have in regards to like, like making anyone feel like they're under the bus is how do I satisfy you know, my quota, oh, right, okay. which is focused on just booking net new meetings, which, you know, she's getting encouraged, right, to hit her metrics. And then on the other side, it's like, but how do I also satisfy the, ind the individual who maybe is saying, you know, I only want my meetings to be fully qualified, right? Because it's like, she's, her incentive is meetings booked. And of course, every AE wants a perfect meeting. So she's like, kind of, teetering both sides. Yeah, and to kind of, sorry, to kind of go off of that, it's, it's not only like individuals, I think it's also with Memory Blue, I do have my quota, but with Sumo Logic, like I also want my numbers to look good there too. So, but on the Sumo Logic end, it's more like those technical conversations. It's more getting like into the weeds with these prospects, like on that first call in order for them to become opportunities in the future. And I think that's kind of where like the blurred line is for me, because right now I'm like, book, book, book those meetings. Like, you know, instead of like, okay, what can I ask you to kind of get you to open up to me to get you so we're kind of going on and like building that pipeline. So those, like I, I want to be successful in both areas. And I also want to make the, like my team on both sides uh, happy as well. So with that, like kind of questions that I can ask, kind of ways I can approach the situation, uh, things like that. Are you more, and Alice, are you more, would you say you're more comfortable on the conversational side of sales like the you know when you get someone on the phone how comfortable are you engaging them in conversation and kind of drilling in and you know just like letting that conversation kind of drive the outcome a little bit um mm -hmm. or are you more like uh by the book you've got your scripts you've got your pre-calibrated questions that you're like trying to stick to this format like how would you or which direction do you say you would lean yeah, I think that's a great question because uh, I think it's a kind of a mixture of both right now. Like I have my script and I try to like look at the sticky notes that I have all over the wall to kind of guide the conversation uh, where I find myself getting lost in conversations is when I ask a question and then I get an answer and it's like something I've never heard before. So Girl, that's man. also <laughs> a very <laughs> it's tough a uh, can't possibly cover the full gamut of questions, answer, answer, response, or relevant response 
and objections, right? Um, but I would start, uh, that's one place that I would start right away is go back in your mind and start thinking about what are the common questions you're getting over and over again? What are the common objections you're getting over and over again? And that's your baseline, okay, for where you're at right now. That's baseline that and say, these are the things that I'm hearing consistently. Like, do this for a week. Like, don't, I wouldn't change much of anything for a week. Just do that for a week and write down, okay, on this day, these are the objections I heard. These are the questions that I was getting. Um, and I don't know, do you guys record your calls so you can go back and listen to them? No, or you we don't. Just... So I would go back. And if you have like, if you can take like, are you on an auto dialer or do you do uh, manually, okay. are you manually dialing oh, with your? No, we have like a platform that we use and I just kind of press the button. Does it, does it like ring to the next one like immediately or do you have like some Oh, time? no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So I, I would like say myself. for like a batch of five or 10 calls, whatever you're comfortable, stop, give yourself five or 10 minutes to think back and think of the responses that you gave to some of those questions or objections and notate those. So I would start by just baselining yourself for a week um, and then take that information to your managers on both teams and say, this is what I'm hearing. This is the feedback I'm getting. These are my responses. Let's talk about this because they need to um, see and hear what you're experiencing as well so that they can immediately start to kind of restructure and help guide you and also give you the freaking answers, right? Because you're not going to have them all. So I would start there, um, you know, right out the gate because I had to do the same thing, which was book meetings, book meetings. And I felt like the script was awful. I was getting all these objections that I didn't know how to answer, you know, so that that's going to happen. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Um, who are you selling to? Like, who is the person, like, who is your target audience? Describe, describe a person for me, like an avatar. And Dina, oh, can I add one have... to this? I'm, I'm sorry. So I'm curious about the onboarding program. So what percentage of this was covered in a, like a formal, here are our customers. It's very common, in my opinion, for tech companies to do a lot, like heavy about the company and the brand and our story and oh, look at our founders. It's a very startup thing to do. But I never like to assume the worst. And so I'm very curious about what was covered so far, how you thought it was, like how much, how prepared do you feel right now to engage with your buyers? And, um, and then, you know, Dana's question from, from here. So I think uh, the onboarding process was actually really extensive and they did a really uh, good job, Sumo Logic, kind of explaining all aspects of the company. So starting with like the staff and how, great sumo is and things like that but then also digging deeper into the technology of what we can do to help different personas um i think when it comes to learning and where i am now with my understanding that's more on me to kind of study more because they give us a lot of resources uh to kind of have like we have it on deck i guess i needed some answers i know where i can find them type thing but that's more on me now because in the beginning when we were doing like the onboarding training I felt like there was so much information just being thrown at me at one time and I like I never knew what cloud security was I like none of those things were something that I've ever learned before so in the beginning onboarding process I I felt like it was just a lot and I was trying to process it I think uh, I haven't taken the time to go back and review it now and how that could possibly help me kind of control my calls. I've just been really focusing on reaching out to people, getting my voice out there, like getting meetings instead of kind of taking that step back and uh, learning the product a little bit more. When it comes to personas and who uh, we reach out to, we have different use cases. So we have DevOps. Uh, those are people like uh, doing infrastructure, uh, arch like the applications, things like that. And then we have security personas. Uh, we try to do like directors, managers, senior security, ops, and then cloud architects. So those are like the kind of three personas that I've been reaching out to. I find that the security people are extremely hard to like crack. Uh, they're, they ne they never give me anything. So I'm lucky if I get like, oh, we use inside 
um, solutions as of right now. And I'm like, perfect. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but hopefully I can kind of get some more information from you. So those are uh, the three main personas that I'm targeting. I can definitely speak to this. I'm actually writing two white papers right now about managed services and cybersecurity um, across North America. So yeah. Okay, so people that are in technology, specifically when they're working on the infrastructure side, there's a couple of things that are happening in the market right now that are framing literally any conversation that's happening about these things. So number one is that everybody knows because of COVID, people have had to, you know, create an online store or create, you know, like an online community. So these are a lot of massive companies that are now paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for staff augmentation, they're outsourcing their development team. But now what's happening is that they have people that are working at home and now they have more sensitive customer data that is being distributed across the country and across the world without a central, you can think of it as like a central node where they can protect the data. So cybersecurity is a massive, massive issue right now. And that's pretty much what most like director of IT people and, and technology people are thinking about. On the DevOps side, you can dive more into that on, you know, if you can in any way help increase collaboration, um, because DevOps teams right now are in such high demand that creating a more effective workplace for them or just collaboration environment is going to help you a lot. I have more to add, but do you want to ask? I know, anything? Dana, that was amazing. I like, I feel like I should have, I like taken deeper notes about that. And I would like your white paper when it's done, please sign me up. Yeah, yeah um, me too. I, okay, I want to sure. add, I want to just celebrate something that you said. And Niles, is that how you pronounce it? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Cool. When you said that there's a large portion of what you're doing now, and that is you're going, you're teaching yourself. And I think that's one of the most magical things about this particular profession, because <laughs> that never stops. And those that continue to go through this, like iterating on their themselves, ourselves, our own skills and get tighter and better and tighter and faster. I mean, that it's literally feels like turning into a diamond after, you know, years and years of pressure in a mountain for, you know, whatever. But anyway, so keep doing that. That will bring you very, 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 very far and know that it never stops, right? So you'll hear people talk about curiosity and these are the best types of sellers. Anyway, right? We live in the information age. There is <laughs> zero excuse for not even for not um, bothering to go look. Uh, but obviously you do not have that problem. The second piece that I want to touch on um, is how what something that helped me as I ventured into IT for the first time, um, which by the way, when you get into like if AE is your goal, right? When you start to get into enterprise sales, you're going to liaise with IT departments anyway, because you have to go through a security check just like you have to liaise with legal. Um, and there's a lot of, all the rules are shifting, right? Because especially with this front end technology, there is nothing standard yet in most cases. So that said, there's a book that's called the CIO in Wolf's Clothing. Or it was a Gartner book. Does anybody remember this one? The CIO in Wolf's Clothing? Um, yeah. I, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I'll find, and I was, I'll find it, but this book, it, was incredible. And you can pull out this um, CIO title and easily stick CMO, right? So it, it's it's not a, a role specific per se. And it draws like heavily from like Machiavelli or Machiavellian, Machi anyway, uh, which really I appreciated immensely. And I, I learned new things in many ways. So I would highly encourage you to check out this book, but understand that there are two types of leaders in, in these departments. And that is... The first is those that are very excited and eager to change and grow and develop, and they preserve their relevance because they they do just that. The second category of individuals, they tend to become more defensive, and they think that their path to maintaining relevance is to put up walls and boundaries. And so this book, I think, is a a very helpful way to allow you to discern quickly early on in interactions, which type of persona you're dealing with, um, because it drastically alters what tactics or how you should go about handling it. Um, and again, 
this book helped me tremendously when I first ventured into uh, all that is <laughs> selling into IT. By the way, in legal departments, no less, which they would, uh, and we're talking about 10 years ago, like go toe to toe with you about how they are safer by hosting everything on premise with like, you know, 20 year old technology and a uh, inferior skill set on their team. And it was just comical. And they actually were like serious and committed to this. So hopefully things are better now, but you know, I'll let you fill me in or Dana could probably tell us all. Hey, one okay. quick point that I did want to point out or emphasize, Amy, you just mentioned it. And I think what has really separated a Niles and since being in the space and has minimized our onboarding time is her curiosity to learn more, right? Um, when I mentor people, I tell people that I want to help people who are in love with the process, not necessarily people who are in love with the result. And like she has fallen in love with the process. So like she's only been in the industry a couple months. She's on this call, like she reached out to Gabrielle for like mentoring sessions. She has like 20 mentors already because she's just trying to figure stuff out. So um, analysis is funny because this is Amy's first time meeting you and she's already kind of was able to acknowledge and identify some of your traits that I kind of always like recommend you for. So keep that up. Thank nice. you. I Can think I at my last job, uh, my boss, I was selling cabinets and my boss there, he was always like, you're never going to learn everything here. You're always going to be learning something new. Someone's going to come in and have a question that you've never heard before. And like, it's, you're, you're always going to be learning. Like there's never going to be a time that you're going to walk in here and you're going to know exactly everything. And he's like, I'm still learning to this day. And he's had the business since like 1996 or something. And I think that's something I've just carried with me. I was like, you're right. Like I go, like I work there Saturday still and I go there now and I have a great, like, product knowledge on it but then I still get these crazy questions that I'm like you know what let me go back and figure that one out for you because I don't know <laughs> so that's definitely something that I kind of carried with me to this job position as well yeah well, I for a parent by the way anyone that's listening that wants to get mentors and is struggling um, to do so or waiting for someone to come tap them on their shoulder demonstrating proactiveness and coachability is a great way to start. And, and I was like, I, I love that Kendrick is advocating hard for you. And, it, but I, you know, honestly, Kendrick, it's so flipping obvious. Like, I mean, she walks into a room, sorry to use the pronoun she, while you're right here in Niles, but it's very obvious. And I'm actually, I want to dig into like, how did you get to our profession? Like our profession needs more people like you bring your friends and their friends, <laughs> like, please. And if anybody needs any help breaking in, send them to me. Um, but anyway, so thank you both. Um, I, and there was one more, but I forgot. Well, I see, I see the, um, Amy, there's a couple things that popped in the chat here. So Dana had a question for situation number one. No, so I actually wrote, this would be, this is just, if you want to take this and you want to actually use this as a call opener or something like that. So I always use questions when I open calls and I'll give you an example. For mortgage brokers, because they're so old school, probably like a lot of the companies you're selling to, but on a much bigger scale, for them, they didn't have any digital presence and they were 100% reliant on referrals to keep their business going. So my question, whenever they answered the phone was, you know, I'm just curious, are you relying mostly on referrals for all of your business right now? Every single mortgage broker said yes. And it, as soon as they said yes, then they were like, so what do you, you know, like, do you help with that? And I was always the next question. And I'm like, I, I literally made like so many sales off of just that one line and I would close sales in 10 minutes. And so what I wrote here in the chat is, I just looked up Sumo Logics. Literally, I totally understand what you guys are doing. It's awesome. In my opinion, there's three, three situations a company could be in and you could approach it. Number one, they're already using cloud-based technologies. So they have pre-existing frustrations around length of time that it takes to troubleshoot something, how long it takes to resolve a security issue, blah, blah, blah. The other two are really similar where they're either in the process of implementing cloud-based solutions or they're thinking about it. Your target should be number one because they're living their pain point every single day. So for somebody like that, I would literally call, figure out how long it takes Sumo Logics to help somebody troubleshoot something and then ask them if it takes longer than that. And if it does, that is a question that will get the attention of a director of technology or VP of engineering. If it's somebody that is in the process of implementing, I would actually not go like that direct. I would more just say like, you know, you actually, you could actually ask the same question. And then if they tell you that they're in the process of thinking about it, 
don't even try and like hard sell them at that point. Just say, ask whoever's implementing, you know, like your cloud solution, how long it takes to troubleshoot something. And if it's longer than whatever, like, you know, send me an email back. That's awesome, actually. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, and I'll, because um, Sumo Logic is very similar to, as far as like the marketing nomenclature and stuff and what you guys are doing to the previous job that I held in IntelliMagic. So we were selling, you know, performance monitoring analytics for IT infrastructure, specifically for like this very niche part of the IT infrastructure, but it did everything that Sumo Logic does as well, you know, modernizes, it helps replace legacy monitoring, things of that nature, and logging, reporting, analytics, all that fun stuff. And so I had to figure out a way to explain what I did in, in a way that like didn't sound like it was just part of like a whole spectrum of other products that do the same thing. Um, and that's really hard to do on an immediate cold call. Like it's never like, in my opinion, it's almost impossible sometimes to portray the advanced, um, you know, full spectrum of what it is Sumo Logic's going to do on a cold call, right? So I think that one of the things that helped for me was building rapport with those tech guys, right, and girls, um, because they are inherently a little standoffish and closed off. Um, a lot, of, I sometimes you'll you'll get one that's like super chatty, right, and they'll tell you everything, but most of the time they're kind of like sitting at a desk. So I put myself in their world, right? They're at a desk, probably at, at one point they were in cubicles with like thousands of other people. And now they're at their desk in their house on their computer monitor with like all of these Excel spreadsheets and different programs running all of the analytics that they're monitoring all their systems with. And they have a Teams chat going and all of this crap, right? That we live, the world we live in, right? They're in that bubble too. So when I call them, I insert myself right into their bubble like I feel exactly what it is that they're going through and I I immediately gauge the vibe uh you know what are what are they giving me are they frustrated are they kind of you know all these people are sitting in their homes bored a lot of times and they will take vendor calls for the sheer factor that they are bored okay I know like I talk to people far more than I should sometimes because I'm just like, hey guys, you're breaking up my day. Um, so I would like, I, I would use that, that psychological aspect of sales in what you're doing too, and especially when the cold calling is concerned. And I know like Amy wants to talk about other stuff and I, I feel you because the, the, the thing, the, the vibe that you give off with something like this, which is a really complicated analytic solution to explain in like, three sentences. Um, the more engaged they are with you and Isles as a person, the more rapport you're able to build immediately, the more likely you are to keep them on the phone long enough that you can ask those probing questions to get to the point where it makes sense to schedule that call with your account manager to give you, you know, a deeper understanding of what it is that we're doing and how we can help you with these problems and solutions. Or to find out if they're not the decision maker, who is? Do they have budget? Do they have timeline? All those things that they're telling you they want more qualified calls, just because that person on the phone isn't your decision maker that's ultimately going to sign the check doesn't mean that they can't give you tons of intel on who is and whether or not they're even in a prime position to buy. I talk to people all the time that have no authority whatsoever. And by the end of the call, I know they're not buying. They just bought this solution over here. If they sign a three-year term license on this product, and I'm, I'm not going to push that out the door. Like they just think it's not dry, you know, so things like that can happen. So I would just say that is a, you know, newbie because I've been there selling very similar technology and I had more success just being me and being more relational and having those rapport building conversations and then growing that into, okay, maybe three or four calls later, I finally nail the decision maker and I can say, well, I spoke to Tom and Jenny and this person over here and I know all this about your business. And then they're like, well, damn, I have to do this call. So I don't know, just, just some two cents there from being in a similar space. Yeah, definitely. That's very helpful. And when you say like build rapport, I think right now, anyone I get on the phone, I'm like, okay, like you, I can get a meeting with you. Uh, instead of kind of uh, figuring out what they're going through, what they actually do, and how that kind of relates to finding someone who could actually benefit from taking the meeting. So definitely going to use that. Yeah. And now, now a quick question. Like right now, out of your day, like 
is like what percentage of it is essentially you've got kind of a call down list and these are people you're cold calling like is that a good chunk of your day right now or how much of it yeah. is that prospecting and then cold calling so i usually start my day with cold calls i'll block off like uh like an hour an hour and a half to do it and then i'll block like another hour for emails and linkedin and then like do whatever meetings i have during the day and then in the afternoon i'll try to depending on like what's going on it's either again in the morning because i work east coast time so i have like a really big chunk in the morning of time uh, to use so i'll do like another call session for like an hour usually like an hour is the second one um and i don't know what percentage of my day that is but i try to get like two rounds in amy amy with the microphone i see your hand was up again it was so funny. I just bought this, guys. This is my brand new Yeti, and I I got it because um, <laughs> I I did the Andy Paul um, podcast, and that was my first time ever being interviewed. And when he had first reached out, I I messaged him back. I was like, Oh my god, please tell me that I need to buy a Yeti. I've been looking for a reason. So yes, this is. It's very pretty. This is the. Uh, I don't even know which brand it is, but um, Target had a great deal. So anyway, thank you for noticing. Um, and Niles, I have a question right now. So there are no wrong answers here and I'll, I'll explain after the fact, but would you mind, tell me about your numbers for the past, for your first month as an SDR? Uh, my numbers, memory blue wise, I booked, my quota was six. I booked and occurred eight. So I think it was like 130 three percent like quota I'm not sure someone messaged me that I couldn't find that number I tried looking okay. um, that's perfect and the other one and then sumo logic side I believe one of the meetings oh that was, ignore that um I had all those same numbers and I also, there's no and wrong answer no wrong answer I think, think pause. yeah 60, I think 60 percent of my meetings transferred over to like at stage too, but that could be wrong. I honestly don't know how to check that and I should figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know, if you're being really particular, you should be taught that. Um, but I digress. So it's interesting that you mentioned that there's this like pushback on whether or not the lead is qualified or accepted for meeting two. Like that's interesting because it suggests that you have, you don't have control over your income. And I don't like hearing stuff like that. Um, you know, and so we talked a little bit before about whose KPI should we follow? Like, and I also, you need to read your comp plan line by line. And first and foremost, you need to do what it says to do so that you can get paid because this is a hard business, especially at the beginning, especially at the beginning, you need to be able to feel, um, the upside of, moving through the learning curve on that process where there is, to Kendrick's point, a great deal of, of joy to be found. Um, that said, there is no skill. Well, I could ask you one more, like if you had to say what skill should you work on right now, right? Assuming that we're not going to try to boil the ocean and, and you know, figure out everything all at once and we're going to do it one at a time. Um, I like to play this game and ask like, what, what would that skill be? And I'm going to leave it to you to answer yes or no, but then I'm going to share the answer. Um, in my opinion, from what I've seen work best with, um, uh, young sellers or new sellers that I've coached or enabled in the past. So would you like to take a stab at this skill or do you prefer, would you prefer that I just share the answer? No, I, let's, I would take a stab at it. Okay. So what is, if you had to say, what is the biggest skill that you should be working on right now and why? Um, and then we'll take it from there. And skill wise, like just in general, no wrong answers. And honestly, however okay. you interpret it is interesting for, for me. Okay. I think the skill that I need to work on myself, uh, as of right now is more time management and more discipline. Um, I think those are kind of things that will be able to help me in the future if I can find like a good stride for myself. Um, and I think it'll just teach me a little bit more about who I am, how I work and like how I can kind of 
control all the other things that aren't really in my control. Love it. Love, love, love. And a very trendy answer, I will say. Time management is certainly having a moment. I will say Daniel Pink, who wrote To Sell as Human, one of my favorite sales books, came out. His new one is called When, um, The Scientific Benefits of Perfect Timing, something to that effect. And it really challenged the way that I thought about time management. And I love like mind bending type um, stuff like that. So if that one is on your radar, I would, I would pick up that book. That said, the most important skill that you could possibly acquire at this moment in time is your ability to measure your own conversions in a spreadsheet. You know, and I, what I mean by that is I think we've inadvertently done ourselves a tremendous disservice by rolling out like Insight Squared, which is a dashboard tool for reps. And, and it's cool because it, it's like a turnkey dashboard, right? Nobody has to configure any dashboards, which is a pain in the, you know what, like an, a supreme pain in the what. So, but the challenge though, is we've removed this idea of like teaching people the fundamentals of how to measure their activity look at their results and then compare the results that they're getting to the activity that they had. And there's some, are you familiar? Everyone knows of the 80, 20 rule, right? Do you know what that one is? So it's Pareto's principle is the official name. And it's, it's, it's really easy. It says that you're going to get 80% of your results from 20% of your activities. And that applies across the board. So when you, I mean, it's like one of these like universal principles and it's mind blowing. So your, your goal really is to identify what those 20% or activities are as soon as possible and iterate on them so that you can tighten up the results that you're getting with the effort and energy that you're exuding. Now, again, I'm not taking away from effort, like an activity, like there is no winning in this business. If you do not do your numbers, right, you've got to do enough at bats, period, end of story. There's lots of different ways to do them. Cold calling is one of many, many, um, often they're mandated, but, and I don't agree with that, but anyway, um, look, so conversions, numbers, um, and then figure out the fundamentals. When I teach this stuff, I normally have someone open up a Google Sheets and we work in a spreadsheet, right? At the beginning, it does not have to be sexy. And there is like, there's a really like a learning process and you don't stay in there forever, but there is nothing more powerful that you can do for yourself right now than learn how to measure your activity, connect your activity to your results, measure your conversions, right? So I, let's say I apply, I call this from this list, right? Set your filters in LinkedIn. And then you look at your, your conversions rates per that tactic. And once you figure out which tactics are working, then you double down and do more of those things. When you can put together that type of iteration cycle for yourself, you will move so flipping quickly so flipping quickly. And it's something that transfers um, into everything that you do moving forward. So well, well past like SDR applications. Okay. I will definitely do that. Well, also, there, yeah, there's right now cool I don't, Ooh. I don't really have uh, anything like that. I just kind of keep track of what numbers I do hit, not really what I'm doing to hit those numbers. Yeah. Did I, I mean, did, don't, don't make, don't overcomplicate it. Um, I mean, like, like Amy said, an Excel document, couple columns, boom, done. I literally used to do a notebook. I mean, I literally would write the little tag. I had like calls, pitches, meetings. And then I would also keep track of how many of those meetings converted to like a paid, you know, a credit card was given to the director or whoever was doing, running the next meeting. Um, and you can literally look at those on a day-to-day -day basis and compare your days. So you can look to see, are Mondays typically lighter days? You know what I mean? Like you can see, I make X number of calls and I seem to book less meetings on Mondays. So knowing that, you know, you can start to correlate some things as whether or not they're performance related or whether that's just like part of the game. Um, and I hate, I hate the term, it's a numbers game, but if you know your numbers, then as a sales rep, you can easily go to management and say, okay, here's, here's where I'm at. Here's my average. Something has changed or you're getting better. You can measure that really easily. And so for me, that was like seeing the tangible, like 
I don't necessarily want like, you know, to be watched over like a hawk. You know, I hate that. Like I hate being micromanaged, but I do know that I need to micromanage myself a little bit because if I don't, I have no clue how I'm really doing. And my boss comes to me and wants answers for X, Y, and Z. I look like an idiot if I can't say I made this number of calls. I put this number of, you know, this much activity in. I spoke to this many people. These are the outcomes. You know, so it's a really simple fix that Amy mentioned, and it'll give you a lot of control. So, like I mentioned, like baselining this next week, you know, of your conversations, what's being said, what objections are you getting, um, you know, stuff like that. Like, and then also start tracking everything. Just keep it really simple and track everything for the first week. And I think you'll find like it'll give you a really nice solid baseline for where you're at now. And over the weeks to come, you can start to gauge, are you improving? Are you declining? Are you staying the same? And that'll give you your own metric of how well you're doing. And you can start setting your personal goals based on where you're at, where your baseline is. Okay, I booked 10 meetings a week or you know, whatever it is. Next week, I want to push myself and I want to book an extra meeting. And you can see the results of that pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. No, have you ever kind of looked at? Have you ever looked at a Pretty quick? Have you have you ever looked at kind of a week or a month and said, okay, I need this much activity, and then kind of worked it backwards, like reverse engineered it to say, you know, that means I need to do this many calls to probably get this many meetings. Uh, in a way, uh, like last month was my first month really reaching out to people. So I like once I hit my quota, I started like the meetings I did book after I hit my quote I started booking for October so I kind of realized okay I need to get eight meetings in October so I can like <clears throat> keep that up and like how am I going to do that so in a way it's not very expensive I, I have a quick question as well um so Amy uh a Amy H you kind of you've mentioned in chat and then you kind of uh mentioned it again you know, like cold calling isn't the only method and, and I'm sure we could have a whole other discussion on the, the, the right outreach by industry. But, but I'm curious, like Niles, is it, is it how much um, flexibility do you have to, to do kind of the prospecting? Like if you want to start with email and then LinkedIn and then phone, is that up to you or is it very prescriptive in terms of this is kind of how you prospect? Um, so we have sequences that we go through, uh, depending on the persona, depending on if they like MQL or like it's purely outbound, um, we put them in different sequences and that was like created by marketing and things like that. So I go off of those um, and usually it starts with a call and then goes into an email and then like the third touch is LinkedIn and then it's like another task. So depending on the sequence that they're in, it goes with that. Um, I kind of, I follow that. And I also will kind of do like my own little thing here and there. If I feel like it's necessary, like I'll do like an extra LinkedIn touch or like an extra email, like an extra call here or there, if I really think that like, there, it's worth it. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much set for us to follow. Amy, I saw you had your hand up. Do you, <laughs> was that a thumbs up or thumbs down? I don't know if there's a the right answer here though, is there? No, that was a thumbs down. I, and I think there is a right answer. So I've rolled out outreach at two different organizations and, and don't get me wrong, I love technology. I love tools that allow people to automate parts of their process so that they can focus on the higher value elements and outreach is a phenomenal tool to do so. What burns me, <laughs> burns me, is this idea of mandating the messaging per sequences. Because what it does is it strips away the fun and the creativity and the ability to experiment with different ways to get people to take action. And when you take, when you take that fun away, when you take away the ability to allow your people to experiment and to have like a, an ounce of autonomy, I mean, first of all, it's terrible for mental health. I mean, the metadata is exceptionally clear on this, like exceptionally clear. Plus your, your team, like right now we call them dynamic systems. And it's the idea of a sales process that allows for like enterprise account executives to apply the best practices that they're learning in real time and then scale it up. 
And it is a phenomenal way to stay exceptionally relevant. So all the companies that you know that are, instead of complaining about all how revenue is disappearing and nobody's doing business right now, woe is us, they're, they're not doing any business. You're absolutely right. But the building next, right next door and the team right next door that is adapting quickly because their team, their individual contributors are allowed to iterate and to experiment on the ground um, is moving everybody in the right direction very, very, very quickly. Anyway, is it a stupid business decision? Absolutely. Is it more common? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our echo chamber is fierce in this industry. Fierce, fierce, fierce. That said, um, I couldn't care less about whether or not an organization, you know, has looked at the data or what they're doing to their people. I'm more interested in speaking to the Niles. That playing and experimenting with ways to get people to take action is the best part of this job. Going and looking at and speaking with the SDR on the team that had that killed it last year, right? Their Pareto principle. Find out what they're doing and start with that. Um, and it is, in my opinion, always better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Um, and it's That's a good one. <laughs> how much flexibility you get when you are a top performer. I used to call it like having the red carpet rolled out for you. Um, and it's very different when you change to uh, like a support function. Nobody rolls out the red carpet and they're not excited when you talk about how learning indicators are a better metric than, you know, a lagging one, like, you know, an improvement in win rate. Um, and I also I have one more question for you, though. Do you know what the team's overall win rate is? for their opportunities, right? Is that something that's talked about? Um, there, like we do like weekly wins and things like that, but I'm still catching on to what it all means, honestly. Okay, so here's why I say that. There's a big difference between playing on a JV basketball team versus uh, the NBA. Big difference, right? And there's different stages along the way, including different divisions when in college. The whatever the win rate is for the collective team will suggest where, um, which division you're playing in. And this is important because we, what's the expression that we um, are most like the five people that we spend the most time with? When you're playing on a professional team surrounded by professional athletes, guess what you become? Professional athletes. A professional, right? My last company, my last, my last job where I carried a bag was 2015. It was Thomson Reuters. And we were in like the 60th, 65th percentile for win rates. And when I moved downstream, like it blew my mind that one of my last companies was under 7% for their win rate for inbound leads, inbound leads. And this was like a totally okay thing, which was mind blowing to me, mind blowing, but like essentially that process that everyone was okay with was setting the team up to win or excuse me, lose 93% of the time. Like that again is a part of the echo chamber. Nobody really talks about that, but just be very cognizant of which division you're playing in both for this role and where you go next. Um, and understand that uh, I, you're, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to look for and wait for and seek out places that are playing professional flipping basketball. Well, I, I'm sure um, Kendrick's going to have some comments on that, but I want to make sure um, Dana and Kendrick can add something before we wrap up. Um, and, and Kendrick, I, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some analogy about uh, college sports, but Dana, um, I'm curious, um, you know, we were talking about outbound, you know, like when, when you were, when you were first kind of building out your, we'll call the sequence to the mortgage brokers, like what did you, how did you iterate that? Like, how did you build that and figure out these are the questions that are working? Hey, Frank, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier too. You got a hard stop? Yeah, now's an yeah. idea. Oh, you both do. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, no, that's okay. Well, in three minutes, I guess, you know, Dana and, and Kendrick, if you guys could like impart your, your advice in like 1.5. <laughs> yeah, I can go, I can go super quick. The biggest thing for me, and I believe this, whether you do sales, I've literally been running a marketing agency, doing marketing and selling for the past three years with technology like this. The absolute best thing that you can do is learn about the market. 
learn the terminology, like just truly like read these white papers, write white papers, write blogs on it, because as soon as you speak their language, they trust you. And with technology people, they usually don't trust salespeople. So that will differentiate you. And you can literally brand yourself as, as the salesperson that understands technology. That is what I tell people. And it allows me to develop a relationship with them at their level that a lot of other salespeople can't do. That's all I'll say. That's Slight addition, nobody trusts salespeople, by the way. We're the second most uh, least trusted profession, second only to lobbyists, which ironically was what I was going to do before I decided to sell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kendrick, what's your last piece of advice for an hour? Yeah, my thing would be, uh, you know, just continue to be coachable, continue to be curious, and uh, continue to be creative, right? I think to Amy's point, what she's saying is like, don't be afraid to think outside of the box. A lot of, um, a lot of the top performers do right but you also have to be in respect to like your employers right and understanding what they're looking for because some people are metric people so it's a balance right it's it's demonstrating what you know they want to see but also doing what's best for you from a performance standpoint so they talked about like better understanding how you use your time which like obviously you just got in its space so it's a little hard for you to pull that but that was a coaching point that i took right if i realize that 80% of my meetings come from cold calling, then maybe I should uptick the amount of cold calling I'm doing. And then if I realize like, damn, actually 80% of my meetings are coming from social selling, that I gotta create my messaging and my schedule around that. So I think like as a whole, I think today was like a pretty tough session in the sense of you're around a lot of really brilliant minds that are thinking so far advanced in comparison to what you've been exposed to so far. But like in after a couple months in the industry, you're gonna be like, damn, like that point Dana made about like being an expert in like my space or the point that Amy made about like understanding how I'm using my time or the other point that Amy HR made, right? About like using different avenues of outreach. I think you're gonna kill it. Like you're made for it. And I think the reason why everyone gave this coaching is cause like they sense that and I always make the joke to you that it's funny because you don't see how far you're gonna go yet. But everyone who meets you is literally like, this lady's going to be a CRO, a CMO, a CEO. So keep doing it. Awesome, guys. I know a few of you got to run. Have a great yeah. weekend. Ciao. Thank you so Thanks much. Today.